Cool. Can I know what was girls' motion veto as well? What, what did we veto? We vetoed yeah. the second one. Oh, vetoed okay. the first one, so we're doing the last motion. Cool. Okay, so that's all the ballot info needed. Hi, I'm Kavi. I'll be chairing this round. Uh, if I could get the panelists to introduce themselves as well, just starting with Charlie. Hello, my name is Charlie. I go by they, them. Hey, folks. Chumaya Mohan. He, they, works me. Congratulations on the break. Looking forward to a good round. All right, cool. Uh, I will be keeping track of time, and I'll do my best to drop timestamps in the chat, but everyone just please time yourselves uh, in case. The round will be recorded, so observers, please don't do anything to... Just don't unmute or turn on your cameras or do anything to distract the speakers. If you guys want to revoke your consent for to be recorded, I guess that's fine as well. So without further ado, calling upon Prime Minister. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Hi, let me just set up my timer. Thanks. Okay, hello. Uh, pure eyes through voice, or you can do the wave the thing, or just raise your hand in the zoom that option. Uh, and if I, yeah, if my audio cuts out, just feel free to cut me off or verbally. Okay. Okay. Starting in three. Two, the world is scary. The world is cutthroat. And everybody around you could be your friend one day and the next day you're sworn they're your sworn enemies. We tell you, and the hill we're willing to die on in government is the fact that there is nobody you can trust but yourself. Keep is to set up the correct choice of debate. Firstly, what exactly does the norm look like? So very intuitive, every person for himself prioritizes the needs of the individual. So you can help other people, but only you can help them if it is within your capabilities to do so. You're not forcing yourself to give aid or to give solace if you can't do it individually. Secondly, how is this storm manifested right now in the status quo? Understand that the way people usually talk about this specific narrative is with the focus on empowerment and actualization. Understand that right now, people like not relying on other people. People want the freedom and independence given to them after they leave their parents or they reach a certain age, for example. So that's how the narrative is framed right now. But even if we're going to be still engaging for the sake of clarity on even in the most extreme cases where you are forced to where you are forced to bring other people down for your own uh, interest that is still justified to an extent lastly what does the norm entail the norm is very simple it entails the societal agreement to it that not just people agree that this is a good thing but people when they grow up when they are being taught this in school they see this as an expectation as to what the future holds the future they're going to be expecting a future that might be cruel that might be absurd and abhorrent but at least they will expect that the only people they can help them that the only people who will help them is themselves the clash is very simple right now in government the status quo norm is that of every every man for himself why are people subscribe to that norm right now in the status quo firstly this is a product of the rising trend of increased liberalization and if it do individuality understand that the comparison that opposition has to defend to an extent if they want to be you know to make, to, if they want to make this debate good quality inherently is that in their side of the house they have to have they have to support a norm that's more reliant on other people or institutions that's more reliant on your family your local community or even your local state understand and this was the norm before when states had unlimited or unchecked power, but right now with a lot of checks and balances and the uh, you know, emb uh, embellishment of democracy isn't the case. That's why the norm right now is that in the status quo. First argumentation then, that understand hey, that prior to this norm being the normalized thing of society, support, the vast majority of support was hyperfixated on the mindset of the hyperfixation on the unfair collective actions. But before that, go PY. So if you are so scared of the cutthroat world, it is only specifically on government there you, where you make it more competitive, more cutthroat when you support the individualistic nature of people. The world is going to be cutthroat either way. So if you can't beat it, you might as well join it. Why is this Why is this such an urgency and a problem when there's have the house in the first place? Understand that during the past, before this norm was normalized in general status quo, so in places, also in time periods like the Middle Ages or the pre-industrial revolution. Understand that because of the mass certainty during those times, people inherently consented to communal lifestyles and over-reliance with institutions. For example, now before a lot of people subscribed to religion because they saw the world as super, super scary and the religion was the 
only explanation. So they all banded together in those communal mindsets and dogmas. But number two, they also consented and agreed to things like extreme state paternalism with massive conscription because when the state tells you that it is okay that we conscript you to, to die in our wars because it's all for the collective good. Understand that because of the surges of this norm, which probably happened due to the rise of liberal and more progressive mindsets that focus on individuality and freedom, this changed the way we think about our society and the states around us. The types of communities in their side of the house, which were established before the rise of the norm, were very rigid. Social classes were often embellished and people in a specific social class could not escape their class. They would die, they would be born and die in the same village or community because of the necessity for the quote-unquote common good. Understand that the implications of this harmful narrative in their side of the house is twofold. Number one, when there is a common good, there are also common requirements to maintain the status quo. Understand, those requirements often imply you doing your job and nothing more because anyone who is an outlier, who is doing too much, who is making too much trouble, risks in their side of the house, risks to have the mindset of risking the stability of the world that they're trying to build. Implications then for government side why it's significantly worse than the opposition. This is twofold. Understand that you get no solvency or lesser actualization to help with this cutthroat world in their side without the norm. Why? Two reasons as to why this is significantly worse for the average individual. Number one, in their side of the house, you strengthen these communal institutions that prey on the most vulnerable. You strengthen religious and state institutions that are trying to brainwash people into telling them you should pay us more taxes, you should pay us more indulgences, you should let us abuse you. Because it's all for it's all worth worthy sacrifice for the common good. But secondly, you know, it's worse than theirs, it's worse than their side of the house with your predominantly mitigating upwards mobility. When you are maintaining and telling people that you should stay in your position in life and not change because it's for the common good, you make it significantly harder for people like minorities to break the glass to break the glass ceiling because number one, their ability to do so is already compromised because it's significantly harder for them because society goes against them when they try to do it in the first place. But secondly, you also impede their ability to dream or want to opt in to the social mobility and upward mobility and breaking the, gla breaking the glass ceiling in the first place. Second argumentation then, the more positive case, why is it better in our side of the house when you have better relationship and you this is better because when you teach kids to focus only on themselves, collectivism primarily encourages in their side of the house learn helplessness and why this is bad. I have four four structural mechanisms as to why it is okay to be individualistic. And all of these operate under charitable frames, right? The first one, understand that in a more cutthroat world, it is still okay to be more individualistic because the world right now in and of itself is very meritocratic. People with good skills are often rewarded with good positions. So if the norm is normalized in our side of the house, when you have that expectation from a young age that the world is shaped, so I have to do my best, I have to do my best in my studies, I have to get the highest score, at least you are cautious and aware of the pitfalls of you not taking your education or not taking your lifestyle seriously. So in terms of preempting all of the harms in the future, you are better in that regard. But secondly, in terms of the in terms of your relationships around you, when people are more individualistic and are inside the house, understand that because of that norm being established in the first place, you have institutions like corporations or other forms of workplace environments that often prefer more individualistic or cutthroat, cutthroat employees because, number one, they see them as the most efficient because they're hyper-focused on their job and doing the best that they can do. But number two, you're also hyper-focused on not really caring about what other people say as long as you get the job done, which is something a lot of uh, organizations um, like. Thirdly, understand that because of the expectation for return, there is lesser expectation for return in our side of the house. So you have less instances of people giving what they cannot have the capacity to give. So in our, so in their side of the house, for example, you have a lot of poor parents bearing multiple children all because they have the hope that these children can help uplift them out of poverty. And instead of actually trying to fix their lives themselves, you get lesser of that in our side of the house. Lastly, it is better in our side because there is less community betrayal. Understand that a lot of monolithic communities like places like Japan and Korea, they often have self-imposed com communal and common identities they are meant to be the same. And any outliers of this, people who look different, who act different, who say things differently, are often ostracized because you are different from the rest of us. That difference that in our side of the house is being celebrated so people are less likely to go against you for that. Really quickly then, Opposition might say, but oh, we need to band together to deal with the world's problems. Understand that the act of banding together and allying is in it of itself already an act of self-interest. Because when you want to fight for your rights, when you can't vote, and you when you see it oh, allying with other people and other movements, can it get you that benefit? We still co-opt it in our side of the house. Thank you. Thank you, PM. Calling upon Elo. Here, here. All right. Hi. The eyes your voice. Okay. I'll start in three, two, one. 
in a world where everyone is cutthroat, the action is not to double down and cut other people's throats, but rather to provide a narrative, a counteracting norms to prove why we can survive this and why we can get better things. I want to clarify the frame and the urgency in this debate because I want to like be clear. What exactly does the world look like right now? We think it looks like four major things. So the first one is that people are individuals in the ground are generally massively lonely and withdrawn in the same way that, for example, social media enables you to enter into particular spaces that only that you care about in the same way that maybe incels and all of these Reddit like Reddit like pop up. But the second thing is there's a massive trend towards deglobalization. In the same way that you have a US China trade war, the way they're putting sanctions on every other like sphere or the emergence of BRICS as an alternative to the global order. But thirdly, there are many other reasons why people are likely innately selfish. Because being maybe being selfish is easy. Being selfish, they see it as necessary for their survival as part of a biological instinct. What is the implication of this framing? One, it is incorrect for government to assert that we need a better norm to be able to be more cutthroat. Because the world is already cutthroat. They don't really prove why this being cutthroat will solve the collective action problems, which I'm going to discuss later. Instead, what we're clear on opposition bench, that one, that a government bench is just terrible in terms of the personal and individual level. Two, it creates a massive social harm, especially to minorities. And three, it is terrible for institutions at the state. I just want to be clear here that we don't really have to prove that government, the, the, the norm for every person of themselves is the cause for all of these harms. But rather, all we have to do that it is the tipping point for worse harms and for those things we have to win. What then is the clear counterfactual coming from opposition? We think that the narrative can exist, but not necessarily as a norm, but rather it exists in like relation with other narratives and other potential norms. So for example, opting into collectivism or helping each other. Why? What then? Um, he responses, right? So government assumes that people cannot be anything more than cutthroat. But we posit to you that there are multiple reasons why people can still be collectivists and help each other. Therefore, the tipping point for collectivism in the narrative to continue to exist is something that can happen. There are three, four reasons why this is true. The first thing is that people do have the ability to have increased empathy due to globalization. In the same way that we can use social media and technology to view war and the suffering of other people and around the world, we are moved and like we feel empathy for them. But secondly, in things like collective action problems, things like the environment or pro problems about economies and peace, we set up global institutions like the UN or financial massive financial institutions to make sure that we regulate everyone's actions so that no one is harmed. But thirdly, the essence of humanity is literally built on community. The fact that we formed together, like, like we came out of caves and we formed together civilizations in order to help each other, not just out of a sense of need, but out of a sense of empathy towards other peoples. But finally, an accountability. Because Gabby seems to assert that we are going to worsen things like harms towards, like, the way that the church or religions can be oppressive. But the fact is, that this is a debate about the present to the future. And the present to the future means that you have things like technology, things like public knowledge, or things like fears about past abuses in the same way that we are scared of the abuses of the Catholic Church means that we do have the ability to correct a lot of these things. All of this means that collectivism is a possible tipping point and is a worthy goal on opposition bench. What then are we going to give you? The first thing is why you create massive personal and individual harm on opposition, the on government. Because first, What's the important piece of framing here? What exactly does the norm do? We think the norm does three things. The first thing, it becomes the standard of morality to be prioritize yourself at every turn at the individual level. But second, on the social level, it becomes a massive expectation. Expectation that you are opting in. And if you opt in, it is not a problem. Because even if it leads to other harms towards other people, it was justified because the norm is that every person should be for themselves. But thirdly, it also does something at the institutional level in the way that it colors state-to-state -state interactions and approaches to the, the diplomacy. It it comes the expectations of how other leaders that they will act in or solely their self-interest and not on the self-interest of others. Why then is government the tipping point for harm? We posit there are three reasons why this is true. The first thing is that you often get worse relationships with your friends and family. So it is entirely valid for you to withdraw or find less value in the relationships that you get your friends or to commune with like your mother or mother's day. But secondly, it also creates a massive epidemic of loneliness and withdrawal because people are more selfish. They're more likely to do things like cut ties, but also because they don't trust other people. They don't look to friends or social support groups to find comfort or they don't look to social interactions. So for example, if this is the case about, let's say, um, you have people who are becoming more and more withdrawn, it is less likely to be able to correct their behavior because they don't want to get help or they don't trust you to provide that help for them. But third, it also results in terrible hyper-competition, precisely because you see others as potential uh, potential competitors as friends to friends because of the scarcity. You're more likely to do things like snitch on like your co-worker for doing, for like, for like, just snitch on your co-worker or snitch on, let's say, your class and be like. So all of these means is to create a 
terribly toxic environment, an environment that the opposition really does not want to live in. Why is all of this important? Because the first things we do is we prove that there's massive loneliness, anxiety, and it's just a toxic environment for an individual to live in. Even if, let's say, you opt into this, the, the norm at, at the fray first, and even if, let's say, an incel thinks that they are justified in the withdrawal, it still hurts to be outsider, to not have access to a lot of the comforts and the goods that you get from interacting with other people. Government might assert things like certainty in protecting yourself. But the fact is, today, the fact that you're able to, the certainty from prioritizing yourself is terribly uncertain. Things like macroeconomic conditions, you could be cut off from your job, even if you put all your effort into job and you could just be homeless the next day. So there's just terribly, the, the value of protection on government is terribly uncertain, but rather the fact where you pull more protection and pull more support from other people, that is where you're more likely to be able to help yourself. But then the second thing is let's talk about social harms, especially to minorities. Before I go on, I'll take a POI. Three. So when you rely on the collective, you assume that the world is significantly better on your side, but that is dependent on the malevolence of the people around you, which you cannot be certain about. But the fact is, th that's something that also exists on your side. So if you depend on yourself, you can't really like be able to protect yourself sufficiently because presumably you also have to, to an extent, rely on other people to get goods. I mean, you can't produce everything that you need in order to live in a day. So I don't really see how this flies. But then the second thing is let's talk about the social harm, especially to minorities. There's two things why this is terrible in government bench. The first thing is you're more likely to treat the poor or minorities much worse. So for example, because of the social expectation, the harm expectation that you care for yourself, you don't enact this obligation towards others. But the second thing is the approach to social movements and less of allyship. So if you're a white legislator, or you're an empower, you're less likely to help others or want to help social movements because it really doesn't affect you. So this is where you're less likely to get changed. But thirdly and more importantly, why it is terrible for institutions and the state? Because the first thing is that it creates a toxic international law and geopolitical environment. It's where you're more likely to get things like beggar thy neighbor policies. For example, in the same way you put subsidies on your own, let's say goods, as opposed to or banning other goods from other countries, precisely because you want to like prioritize yourself or do things like pulling out of international groups like the ICC or like important global supply chains. But also, secondly, it's also terrible for local laws and regulation because your approach to collective action problems is to put the burden on the individual in the same way that maybe you would probably like uh, encourage like encourage them to recycle as opposed to like running after the company that caused all of these problems. At the end of the day, why is opposition winning this debate? The first thing is that we are very clear about the vulnerable actors. These are marginalized individuals who cannot help themselves. In government's world, these individuals are fucked over on opposition at the very least because of all the counter narratives, they still have a chance. For all these reasons, oppose. Thank you, Hello, calling upon DPM. Yeah, yeah. Copyrights through voice. Hmm. Okay, starting my speech in three, two, one. A man is always safer alone rather than with people that he cannot trust. And this is the world that opposition has to defend and has to trade off. Because majority of the time, the comparative that comes from Terra is not necessarily fair for the debate because they just simply explain that everything is shit on our world, but on their side, people think kumbaya and have good incentives. That is just not fair debating at all. The first thing that I want to respond to is that they explain that the cutthroat world is created by this norm and therefore, therefore it's a much more worse of comparative. I want to explain as to why that's untrue, that the cut world throat that we see right now was not created by this norm, but rather the mechanisms in which the prior to the norms existing have already been propagated by many individuals out there. Firstly, on why the collective good has been weaponized, we view individual people as always in the indispensable individuals, that we sacrifice the minority for the sake of the good of that community, and therefore that's the reason as to why we are okay with letting go of some of our people, because we don't care about their interests, we care about the interests of our society. Number two, 
It also means that the alternative of the norm, which is the man for his community, has often been recognized by the privilege that some must suffer for the benefit of the rest. And these are things that we are okay to live with because we understand that we must sacrifice other individuals for the sake of our own safety or our, our own survival. That is the world that they live in on all their side of the house versus the empowering message on our side of the house that, that, that it means that you have to care for yourself, prioritize your safety, to ensure that you fight for the rights that you deserve, given the fact that we're all equal in this narrative. I think that the second thing that they launch in this debate is that, oh, a lot of the capitalist structure or conservative structure or structures that are likely going to be isolationist will exist on our side of the house. Three reasons as to why that's true. Firstly, cooperation should not be something that you impose, but rather self-determined for yourself, because on their side of the house, cooperation is something that is forced by the privilege or by the people in power. Every man for themselves also means that you have an interest to cooperate, an interest of stronger diplomacy because you know that you cannot no longer indoctrinate individuals to believe in the narrative of being one for global order. I think that's the reason as to why you get things like ideals of toxic nationalism on their side, the dominance of the West against the global South that makes sure that a lot of the trading practices and trading routes that they have is convenient towards the people that creates global order in this society. I think that's the reason as to why it's okay that we have things like de-globalization de because it's a response towards the dominant culture that allows us to have global order but also means to sacrifice things like the global south. That's the reason as to why regional partners exist. That's why ASEAN existed to counteract the narrative that the global order must be preserved by the people in power, by the people of the top, top echelons of society. The last thing is that that means that you also can no longer indoctrinate individuals to opt into this narrative and therefore you're likely going to create better deals on our side of the house. That's the reason as to why we're likely going to see more abilities for both hegemonies to give better trading deals towards smaller countries, given the fact that they understand that they can no longer rely on the ideals that we are stronger together, but rather individuals right now are rather becoming more radicalized and more isolationist and therefore higher incentive for better goods and trades and services. I think these are things that are you see on our side of the house because they understand that they can no longer rely on the norm that they relied in the past. The last thing that they say is that you're going to create a very toxic environment and people such as the obligations that you have towards things like um uh, like, like your children or your family members or whatever i think number one other zara was right other narratives also exist on our world and therefore things like the obligation of the parent towards the child still exist but that means that opposition must also fight for the alternative that the obligation to the child towards their community also exists and pressures the child to do the same thing versus on our side of the house we still have things like love and care still exist so yes every man is for themselves that means every man for their own interest so they probably still care about their family their wives their children or whatever so that means you can still see things that are good on our side of the house but the prioritization of this debate is whether or not you can protect yourself from things like capitalism, patriarchy, or things like conservatism, which the process of opting out is much more faster on our side of the house because you understand that you don't need to stay within this community. To extension them, while even if the community is benevolent and good, it causes a lot of psychological harms towards that individual person. I think that this is important because this is a generous engagement and a proper comparative of this debate. And I don't think Tara offers the same thing because she just listed a bunch of harms without explaining as to why the counter narrative on their end is much more better. But they also cannot just defend a simple narrative. They also def must defend a norm because the absence of one norm also allows another norm to proliferate, which is Gabby's first argument that they don't necessarily respond to. Three, four mechanisms as to why this is worse off on their side, even if the community is good. One, the guilt that you feel in the capacity that you cannot help enough in the community is much more stronger. Majority of immigrant, like second generation immigrant children often feel, feel this and therefore create immense amounts of guilt towards their own specific parents, even when their parents were harsh to them. Second, internal conflict of your own identity does not match with your specific community is also heightened on their end. For instance, in places like where there's the higher conservatives, such as religious communities that you don't necessarily opt into or are given to you by things like birth lottery are worse off on their end because what if your identity doesn't necessarily align with the identity identity of that community and you don't necessarily see yourself as someone who can sacrifice their identity. Like for instance, if you're gay in a religious community or if you're someone who don't necessarily align with conservative or filial piety val val values. Thirdly, it also means that you have pressure to give back at a very early age, which is much more worse of alternative on their side when we pressure a lot of vulnerable young actors to give back to their communities when they cannot necessarily do so in this specific economy. But four, it also means that we compound the resentment during periods of conflict internally. Understand that communities themselves 
also face things like fluctuation, things like a financial recession, things that are, are not necessarily part of their control that makes them a much more worse off community because you cannot necessarily like opt out of this. I think there's three specific impacts to this. I think that the every man for themselves solves a lot of that internal guilt and internal problem, which we are sure on our set of dance because a lot of Paris claim is quite speculative on a macro level. At least on an individual level, we are much more sure. We remove guilt when you opt out of your community or you don't necessarily feel pressure to self-impose a lot of that obligation. Agency to self-determine, so such as passions and skill, instead of being indoctrinated to think that you must always do the career that is good for your community. I think the certainty is stronger on our side, but you feel yourself from guilt, pressure, and internal uh, like conflict, which ought has to engage on why they're okay with sacrificing this. Second extension quite clear, clearly. I think we gain more diversity and empowerment through norms like every person for themselves, such as you teach your children that you have to care about yourself first before anyone else, such as women must prioritize themselves over their husband, which counteracts a lot of the worst of alternatives such as patriarchy or conservative or even things like capitalism. I think that's much more better on our side. But second, it also means that parents don't see children as an attachment of themselves, but an individual person who is going to be independent and therefore they don't face a lot of this burden and, uh, and obligation. That creates a much more altruistic like, community that understands that these people are individual people. The norms is also likely to support things like diversity or individualism, which are good for every society, which we encourage within communities to respect these choices, that every man for themselves means that you allow them to opt out when they want to. The comparative is much more better, which is a toxic environment that people opt out and don't necessarily benefit any, uh, anymore from that community, but it also means that it's better because we don't toxically pressure people to opt in the community that they don't align with. Thanks. Thank you, DPM. Calling upon DLO. Here, here. Hello, am I audible? Yeah, clear. All right, wonderful. I'll give me a couple seconds. I'll just fix my notes. Also for POIs, just raise it once verbally. Thank you. All right, I'll be starting my speech in three, two, one, go. Government seems to believe that we are still stuck in the 1800s where collectivism is the dominant narrative and the point at which we oppose the institution of individualism is the point at which we now overpower things such as harmful institutions such as the church or even the state or even patriarchy. I just want to first deal with this idea coming from government that norms or narratives cannot coexist because they assume that the counterfactual on our side is that we have to defend collectivism to the fullest extent. But the reality is that is simply not the case. We argue to you and we posit that narratives can coexist to the extent that it's already happens in status quo. When you look at, for example, narratives of having to work hard so that you are going to be financially free, but also narratives that tell you to rest and take time for yourself and not overburden yourself with being financially free in the first place. Narratives can coexist to the extent that they are and that they are strong, but not to the extent that they're going to be toxic. The point at which you, re you reach toxicity is the point at which you support an over is the point at which you already support a very prevalent narrative such as that of individual uh, such as that of individualism, which is exclusively what happens on government, wherein individualism, as they describe, is already powerful powerful and prevalent in status quo. The point at which you support it on government is where you realize and materialize all of the forms of toxicity, being overly competitive at the expense of other people, but also to the extent of even just pushing off other people who are not going to benefit from you. The clear victim in this debate are those people who are unable to help themselves, those minorities that do not have a voice, which is precisely where collectivism precisely helps them, and individualism and the support of it further harms them and further entrenches them in the harms such as that of capitalism, patriarchy, and whatnot. The first thing I want to deal with then is this argument coming from Gabi, which talks about why it's better for the individual on several levels. First, they talk about how the world is meritocratic, therefore you have to serve yourself. Second, they talk about why co companies prefer cutthroat and individualistic people. Third, they talk about why people are able to be more individualistic now outside of their own cultures. The first call out here is that they don't explain why we can't do this on our side. Literally, status quo is heavily individualistic in nature already. I am unsure then as to what the marginal gain is when you already when you are already individualistic and you support this even further. Given that people can opt into this on 
on either side of the house, I am unsure as to what more gain you get on government at the point in which people are already, already able to opt, in, to opt into this. Secondarily, we'd even go to the extent of flipping this and proving to you why you decrease the extent of being cutthroat and why you increase the ability of people to enjoy life at the point in which they are not too individualistic in nature. And this is where I'll talk about why people are going to be less malevolent on opposition, where you have a countervailing narrative. And this is important because it will prove to you that we decrease the toxicity, the toxicity of individualism. The premise here is simple. When we have collectivism, collectivism as a counter-narrative, we stop people from going to the extent of being selfish to the extent of, of having to step over other people. Because the notion that we instill in people's heads is that your actions come at the expense of other people. And to the same extent, when someone acts in their own capacity that harms you, all, all actions are then intertwined. Which means that we create a somewhat codependent world where we understand that our actions have ramifications not only to us, but to other people. Which means now that people become more empathetic to the extent that they're not going to go that not, that they're not going to go be competitive at the expense of other people. What exactly then are the benefits of this? The first thing is that we the, the implication of this then is that on our side, we are still able to be individualistic to the extent that it benefits us, but not to the extent that it harms other people. So when it comes to climbing the corporate ladder, yes, we're still going to be meritocratic. Yes, we're still going to focus on our skills, but we're not going to do things such as snitch on our co-worker who is, go who is going to be ineffective. We're not going to do things such as lie about what we're working on. We're not going to do things such as being deceptive just because we want to further ourselves in our career, which means then that we push collective, we, we push individuals further when they work together and instead of having to pull each other down, which means then on the comparative, on our side, yes, it might be slower when you are not deceptive, when you are not a liar, and when you're not hurting other people, but the benefit is more people get to move forward in scale when they are working together as opposed to trying to pull each other down versus the comparative on government where it is a zero-sum game where the success of one means the loss of another, which means that overall in general, society is better off to the extent of they are still able to be individualistic, but not at the expense of others. They are still likely to benefit themselves then. The next thing I want to deal with then is the case coming from Kim, which talks about how, oh, look, people can only certainly help themselves because the world is horrible. I already disproved this in my prior point. When you tell people that your actions affect other people and that you ought to be, that you ought to not harm others, otherwise they're going to harm you as well, proves to you that people are going to be are not going to be malevolent because they are they are in fear of backlash. What's your POI? You can't have both things such as altruism and yet care for things like personal interests. You still need to create a trade-off, which means that collective norms will be stronger on your end if you don't support things like the norm of you being uh, caring for yourself and your self-interest. The trade-off we're, we're willing to make here is a super individualistic world, which is what government had to defend because the world is already individualistic. The case that we're fighting for on our side is that we can have two interacting narratives that work with each other. Yes, maybe individualism will still be strong on our side, but the point at which we have a counterbalance to it is the point at which we prevent the worst of harms that can happen on our side, which is precisely why we're winning this debate because they don't even respond to this frame. They just keep constantly pushing this idea that, oh, only one more and more narrative can exist. We are not supporting a single norm, we are not supporting a single narrative. We are supporting narratives that can interact with each other. And you get this quality of interaction when you fight back against the very dominant and strong narrative of individualism already. Moving on then into uh, moving on then into the idea of certainty of protecting yourself. I want to first note that there is diminishing marginal utility on their side from supporting the norm. People already are, in, are already innately are already innately selfish or intuitively selfish to the extent that they want to protect themselves, which means that the narratives of self-preservation already exist on our side to the extent that people want to protect themselves. So I'm uncertain as to what extra benefit they're able to appreciate on their side. So what then is the benefit that stands coming from opposition? And the answer is very simple. Why exactly is helping others better from us? The first reason is that you probably, you're probably taught from a very, from very early on to be altruistic and helpful, maybe to some degree, to counter the narratives of individualism. So maybe if we have to defend collectivism, this is the extension, right? But also secondarily, you're maybe even incentivized to donate or be a philanthropist. Secondarily, given the predominant narrative and intuition of self-preservation, you are unlikely to be giving to the extent of harming others or harming yourselves because you understand the value of your own humanity and you understand the value of certainly protecting yourselves. Third, even if we have to defend the extent of harm where we find it, where we where we have we are, where we have to harm ourselves, we are fine with it because we understand the value of the collective that the collective effort that we want. So the first thing I want to note then, who is likely to be the one sacrificing things for the greater good? I want to note it's precisely the people who are in places of who are in places of privilege because on either side of the house, those minorities are going to be fighting for their rights and fighting 
uh, to to their wits end in order to achieve what they want. Which means that the extent of sacrifice are for those who are in pe- for are for are for those people who are in places of power already. So it looks like, for example, the Ivy League students who are going to set up encampments in Columbia in Columbia University, for example, or for example, those people who are in higher places of power who ought to care about other people. The the sacrifice that they're willing to give here is that they are going to risk their own safety in order to protect the minorities. And this is precisely where you get a greater benefit to protect these minorities when you have someone else protecting them beyond themselves. And this is exclusively coming from opposition because in, in, in the world of individualism, you have no incentive to care about these minorities because it is every man for themselves. You place the responsibility on these minorities to care and protect about themselves. Comparative to our side, where you get more people opting into it and you create more protections for them at the point in which you reach critical mass. For these reasons, oppose. Thank you, Diallo. Calling upon Gavit. Here, here. Sorry, I don't know if I'm audible. And there's uh, response. Yeah, okay. I think we can hear you quite well now, but there are times when your audio becomes a bit softer. Oh, okay. Uh, do I have to be this close? Am I audible now? Yeah, clear now. Okay, thank you so much. You are not guaranteed protection in a world where even the people who are supposed to protect you are likely going to harm you or can harm you. And this is exactly why you have to trust yourself on government side. First call out, it's extremely unfair and uncharitable from opposition that they try to say you can be individualistic too because this means that their side has so much individualism that you need the collective to be to become like to counter this individualism. Therefore, they can also have individualism. I want you to vibe check this. First of all, it sounds like bullshit and so far as they have to make a trade-off and they say we take the trade-off of being individualistic but that's not a trade-off the trade-off they have to take is willing to give themselves up and being able to form a collective and making the collective norm a stronger power what does this call out mean this call out means it's extremely unfair that for opposition to try to go off a lot of the harms and a lot of the benefits that we give you without necessarily explaining to what extent collectivism is able to do a lot of these things because they trying to tell you oh no our burden is to explain that the world is bad because of individualism we just have to say it's becoming worse yet they don't explain to what extent it becomes worse even if opposition whips come in comes in and do that we think it's unfair if they can have a degree of individualism i think we can also have a degree of collectivism this is exactly why we still have things like we're still able to use personal interests to band together and to fight for things like rights and movements this is exactly why we're still able to support each other in times of need because we view it as transactional and we still gain from supporting other individuals it's not an extreme it's not an extreme world where they try to make it that our side only has people who will fuck who will just say like fuck off everyone like we only like ourselves that's the extreme case it's unfair we tell you what is likely to happen and what is moderate that's second thing they we if both teams agree that the world is bad and opposition tells you that the world is individual is too individualistic they don't have solvency on their side because they never give us mechanisms as to why collectivism is actually efficient. At best, they try to tell you, oh, collectivism is good because we hold hands, sing kumbaya, and pray together. But that's untrue. Insofar as they don't give you structural reasons as to why collectivism is good, they don't even paint a picture of who you're trying to rely on. Are you relying on your family who already has an obligation to take care of you on government side? Are you relying on a larger community of maybe POC or queer individuals? Individuals who have their own personal interests who aren't likely to help you because they have their own worlds and problems to care about. These are different things that opposition never solves. And if opposition tries to solve it, that's already building a whip and it's unfair. 
Next, it's untrue that the world is already extremely individualistic. Insofar as we have so many structural things in place, like i.e. religions that have so much power over a lot of states like the Philippines and Malaysia, or even government structures that make sure that you have to be a collective. Therefore, they make sure that you that you have to uh, you have to be doing things like getting married or having NGOs to get a lot of benefits from government welfare. There is also generational beliefs where the tight-knit families and tight-knit communities like immigrant parents and immigrant communities abroad are likely to enforce collectivism upon you. And this is exactly why we need the norm of individualism to counteract a lot of these strong forces of collectivism. So if it is a deadlock on what the world looks like right now, we've already won the debate on both sides where the world is extremely individualistic because we argue that you cannot fight against a system, you just join them. And if it's in a world that is extremely collective, then therefore it is a necessary norm to be had. Next issue then, are you actually likely to succeed when you rely on yourself and when you are more everyone for themselves? Because government tells you four things. That one, you are rewarded on meritocracy. Therefore, it's likely that if you work hard enough, you are able to do things like get scholarships or get promotions without having to worry other things. They, their response to us is to just say, oh, this is a zero-sum game. We don't want to put other people down. But they concede that the world is a zero-sum game eventually. We have to put people down. Resources are finite. From Promotions are finite. A lot of slots in our academics or in our jobs are finite. Therefore, we have to be able to fight for ourselves. They don't tell you why it's more important to give your friend a slot to your promotion just because they are your friend or just because they are your distant relative. Secondly, you are more cautious of others that are going to have their own interests. And I think we've proven this from Kim and Gandhi, who already tell you that a lot of their own interests are maybe they're not horrible, bad people who are selfish, but they just have more proximate needs that they want to tend to, or they have no capability to actually help you and it's okay that you are not it's okay that you are not able to have more of these relationships because they eventually become things that are they eventually become things that are people that you are beholden to and it's okay for us to have less friends and lesser relationships and it's unclear to me why that's such a bad thing we actually flip them and argue it's better because we are now more conscious of the people we trust and therefore the people who we actually do trust are good people that we truly actually have good relationships with so lastly situations where you are the outlier and understand no response at all from opposition they trade this off they tell you that you we tell you that you don't expect help you stop the learned helplessness because you already understand that you are an outlier you will be shamed or you will be kicked out of your community and therefore you have nowhere else to go if all communities are extremely tight-knit on opposition side this is really harmful because there are a lot of minorities who aren't able to find further communities therefore it's harder for them to opt into already tight-knit already for individual like individual groups and communities what is opposition's response to us they say oh we have shit relationships we turn into incels and we hate the world and we already responded to you from kim but we tell you it's untrue because if something benefits us we're unlikely to actually cut it off the conclusion is simple you are likely to succeed because you're hardwired to fight for yourself every decision that you make is for yourself and to make your, make sure that you are not dying in the slums or you are not dying in a ditch you do not burn out from the feeling of obligation to a community that you cannot uphold because even they don't explain how you have the capability to uphold a community's interest and a community's needs. It's not that you just take from a community. Remember that you also have to give to a community and if you aren't able to give to the community it's unlikely that they help you. And if you aren't able to give to a community, then the community as a whole is not a strong support system at all. Therefore they also rely on individualism before they become a community or a strong collective action it means that you have to position this argument as a prerequisite to them. We have to be individually capable before we help a community. Otherwise, we are all just poor at the same time. We're all just sad at the same time. And we are all just depressed. So this conclusion is important because this mitigates significantly more harms from the, on, on government side. Vulnerable people are able to protect themselves without feeling guilt, without feeling shame of opting out of their communities, which we have proof that they at some point will want to opt out of these communities. Communities. You give them a form of escape, which is why exactly this is necessary because they don't consent to anything that opposition imposes upon them. Thank you, Governor. Calling upon Albert. Hear him. All right. Um, am I audible? Yeah, you're clear. All right. Thank you. 
I'll just get my timer. POIS, you boys. Starting my speech in three, two, one, go. Don't let government deceive you on how the norm manifests in a psyche of an individual. The wording of the phrase itself, every person for themselves, means you perceive everyone as responsible for their own future. That it assumes everyone has the capacity to change the course of their lives and that they have complete control to practice full agency. The reality is they don't. They don't have that ability. And it's important to realize that some people are more capable than others. Because if everyone is selfish, it's really unclear the extent of how minorities can practice the autonomy of protect protecting themselves when likely they do not have the tools to be able to protect, them the protect themselves in the first place. So that's exactly my question that comes from government side when they say that they can at least have the certainty of protecting these minorities when they do not give you any positive material why suddenly being quote-unquote more cautious suddenly gives you more protection and immediately makes you higher in terms of the playing field compared to all of the others that will likely be also selfish and likely will outcompete you anyway. We think that means that it's only on our side where you are only able to acknowledge your role and your contribution to a cause when you do not have to subscribe to this norm because you are receptive to the idea that people need your help and that people can ask for your help. You are expected to help when you are in need. You can ask for help when you are in need. The incentive to become more benevolent only happens on our side when we don't subscribe to the norm because we realize the responsibility of each other is when we are together and we can help each other through that. What exactly are the questions of the debate that I'm going to answer through my issues? Firstly, what exactly is part of the norm and what isn't? Because I think that there's a lot of uh, impacts that come from government side that isn't really necessarily the tipping point of this norm happening and they have to concede that this isn't actually something they get under their side. Firstly, what is not part of the norm? The whole idea of individuality and diversity. Just like vibe check this claim coming from government because real in reality, the phrase, the phrase or the concept of like, every person for themselves does not increase inclusivity. It does not also cause you to gain less discrimination or harassment. Because the root cause of why you're likely to do this in the first place is because people are just inherently different. And that's not something that comes from the fact that, oh, you think that collectivism means everyone have the, has the same identity or is monolithic. That is clearly not something that is changed just because you think of the norm of every person for themselves. Every person for themselves is about like obligation. It's about the traje trajectory of your life, not how you express yourself and how you identify as a person. Clearly, this is not something that they get on their side, but I'm going to weigh that off later in terms of a a Kim's extension. The second thing that isn't part is about self-sacrifice. Because notice how we frame this debate that obviously everyone has a biological innate selfishness because that's literally how humans work. You are in, in you are innately selfish because you have a biological need to preserve yourself. So obviously, basic necessities and basic things that you need to survive are things that we can still go up. Obviously, the norm is not the tipping point for you to be able to gain these things or to be able to protect yourselves with these things. It's also not uncharitable to say that this is true because you had to prove the delta of supporting the norm because literally, that is the burden coming from government side that you have to prove why having more individualism or this norm in reinforcing that individualism is something that's like to get the marginal benefit because they don't prove that necessity of supporting the norm. They don't gain that extent of benefit on their side. What is therefore part of the storm? And this is exactly how we uh, engage with all of their material. Firstly, their idea on reliance on common good which institutions can abuse. Firstly, I want to point out that bad institutions are symmetric. The question th then becomes, where do you have the capacity to combat it? Because either side people will have bad actors or people will have bad institutions. Firstly, the certainty to protect yourself is not proven when most vulnerable people cannot even have the capacity to protect themselves by themselves. So that means that you don't correct anything on government side because no one attempts to help people overthrow that oppressive institution at the point at which everyone is for themselves. That means that it's only on our side where we lessen the extent of harm of greed and selfishness because you create a standard for empathy, for kindness, for community. And that's why we exactly protect minorities better on our side because that's exactly why 
why social movements cannot be co-opted because social movements needs critical mass on government side if every person is for themselves and they argue that individualism will have social movements anyway that's that's true they will have social movements but notice that the amount of people that will opt into your social movements are only to the extent that the people are affected by your issue or by your social issue so you don't get allies you don't get institutions that actually care for you because it's only at the point at which people are affected by your issue will they actually care about fighting for your cause and that's exactly why it's so harmful because social movements cannot mobilize themselves at the point at which you don't gain that critical mass and it's only possible under our side because the comparative is you have that con responsibility you have that contribution to help others who are in need that means that like at least in on, in our side we also have ability to correct institutions like notice all of the institutions they posited about like being abusive is like the state or the church but obviously they have existing checks and balances because they're an existing is institution they're literally made up of leaders they can probably elect and have like you know replace or overthrow at the point at which on our side both on the individual level and on also in the institutional level you don't have any mitigatory po uh, policy on, on government side when everyone is selfish and everyone's competitive it's just a worse off world under their side but also, let's deal with the idea of reliance through extents. Because government exacerbates the reason why people are distrustful in the first place. Because you enable the mindset that everyone is on their own. That means that also the existing abusive institutions and the already malevolent actors will likely be even more selfish and more abusive at the point at which you agree with the idea that they should only think about themselves. That's how you get more abuse. Any POIs? There's a tension in your case. Tara said that you support norms of collective action, but Meson operates in status quo where you want to protect things like individual interests. Those are dichotomous norms where your collective actions becomes more weaker, so you cannot claim that all people will join and band together towards things like minority causes. No, those are interacting narratives at the point at which they, they can coexist because even at the point at which you prioritize collectivism, that's possible because at the very least, we still have the ability to subscribe to the metric of individualism when you're able to give everyone the capacity to fulfill their own needs. So that means that, therefore, let's weigh the psychological, psychological harm of the extension coming from Kim about communities, and this is something that they've also doubled down on. We want to weigh this specifically because that means, because we don't agree with the idea that because you're not the same as other people, you're suddenly going to be discriminated but even at the best case that they are, we think that at the very least, you can still find the community that's eventually willing to accept you. That is the main exclusive benefit that comes from our side. Because regardless, that, that idea of like selflessness is something that's exclusive on our, under our side because their comparative is selfishness. That means that you're willing to accept them because no man is an island. You're going to find some people that will be willing to accept you. But notice that if you're not equipped with the mental tools to protect yourself, you're fucked on their side. Because that means that you're scared to ask for help. You're ashamed, ashamed for asking for help. And you're probably going to get even more harassed when you ask for help because you are literally on your own. That means that there's more shame and guilt and more psychological harm on their side if you fail to succeed to protect yourself. With all of these results, this is the only like this is the only point at which you have to believe that we actually protect minorities and protect the most vulnerable. You have to side with opposition. Thanks. Thank you, Albert, for calling for an reply. Here, here. Hello. Okay, starting in three, two, one. The single flaw of government bench and the reason why they will lose this debate is because they don't explain the value we get from having more individualism in the world. All they do is say that we should go with the flow. But precisely when the flow exists, why is it that our like our action has to be one to subsume to it as opposed to try to make it better? Two important things coming from this reply speech. The first thing is let's talk about individual success and contentment and the second is social structures. First thing on individual success and contentment. What does government say? Government says that there is certainty when you're able to protect yourself, especially in a world where everyone is already trying to, is, or in a world that is already cutthroat. How does opposition win this discussion on three points? The first thing is, is that we want to point out the very first piece of framing that comes out of Gabby's mouth is about why the world is tended towards selfishness and is fucked over. They also agreed that people can be, have innate like values of selfishness and do have innate like instincts to protect themselves. So this means then that this already means that on government bench, 
the delta is unclear because people will protect themselves anyway. But then even if you don't believe that, the second reason as to why we win is because they say and assert that they get certainty. But they don't really prove certainty in comparison to the multiple structural incentives that we give to you. How one, they themselves also agree that the world that we live in is shitty, that people can't get fucked over. Or two, the fact about like volatile macroeconomic conditions means that you could have a job today and lose it the next day. But three, even and especially when they exist on the frame that some turn individuals live in oppression, how do you have the tools to liberate yourself from your oppression precisely when you protect yourself? But then thirdly, so this means that it's very, very difficult for government to get their certainty value that they try to die off. But thirdly, we want to point out that this is about a ruthless, competitive market. Because the only way that government bench succeeds and gets their impacts is when one person or maybe a few group of people choose to be selfish. But no, because in this debate, they are defending a norm. They are defending that everyone does it, that everyone expects every other individual to do it. So this means that on their world, every if everyone is trying to fuck you over, any incremental gain that you try to get on your side gets a net zero margin. So with all of these things, the margin on government bench, the marginal benefit of certainty, it just does not exist. It's just terrible. Terribly unclear. Why is this clear on opposition? Because an opposition comparative, regardless if whether or not if you believe our true counterfactual about these interacting narratives, or even just if we have to die in the hill of collectivism as the sole counterfactual, even if some people fuck you over, because this is government's best case, they say that you will be oppressed and that people will fuck you over and it will be toxic, blah, 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 blah. Even if some people do it, the margin is other people will also help you because the counter norm and the counter narrative exists because collectivism exists. So the net benefit is positive. If on government bench, no one helps them because everyone is for themselves. On our side, and everyone is fucking off everyone else. On our side, even if some people fuck you up, at least other people help you. I think that's a clear win for opposition. The second thing is let's talk about social structures, right? Because government says that they will worsen, we will worsen social structures like patriarchy, capitalism, and you increase the guilt and pressure. How do we win this? I just want to clarify and point out that patriarchy, capitalism, and religion exist on either side of the debate. Patriarchy is not caused by collectivism, guys. It's caused by men feeling superior to women like 10, 20, 10,000 years ago. So this means that this is how we flip it. Because we prove to you that government bench actively worsens a lot of the oppression that they say. Because it's not just minorities and the oppressed who will prioritize themselves and try to seek freedom, but also people in power who prioritize themselves. So if we follow Gov's logic where everyone in their world prioritizes their own survival, it's where on their side where the privilege double downs on oppression. And you have Wall Street fuckers who trade and short sell until they cause financial crisis and like poor people lose their jobs. On our side, even if minorities find it hard to break free or feel guilt, and that is fine, even if to some extent they can be oppressed, there is a higher probability if we have to die in the hill of collectivism to solve the problem because there's a narrative that says these privileged should care for people that they don't, that doesn't really affect their lives. No oppressed person, or very rarely do they ever free themselves. They do need an insider, who, one who has power. On opposition, we prove to you we get that narrative to cause that insider to help all other people. And for all these reasons, never been prouder to oppose. Thank you, Ob Reply, calling upon God Reply. Hear him. I open it up. Where are the glasses? In the... There it is. Oh. Okay. Okay. A norm is not like any other narrative in society. Because understand that when there is a norm, there is only one of it that people subscribe to. You cannot have two conflicting norms happening at the same time. Like, for example, we cannot have two norms two norms where one of it is polygamy is okay versus the other one being polygamy is frowned upon in the same society and in the same state because understand that the norm is the primary focus and the primary, uh, primary thing that people will look and expect it upon themselves and those around them. And insofar as that the concepts of individualism is antithetical to those of collectivism, you cannot have 
and both at the same time. Opposition cannot get away with getting their cake and eating their fried chicken. Understand that because it's antithetical to each other, there are three main criticisms of the entire opposition case. Number one, they are completely unfair in terms of their trade-offs. Why? Because when they try to push their trade-offs into us, they try to tell us that we have to trade off the most extreme instances. But when they have to talk about their trade-offs, they only talk about the the the, the little the, the things that are not as likely to happen in the first place. Because when they talk about the framings in and of itself, they try to get both, but yet you can't get both. Your urgency has to be exclusive to their side of the house. Secondly, I'd like to criticize the contention within their first two speakers. Tara, and this was pointed out in Kim's POI and that Lauren didn't properly respond to. Tara first tells us that we want to prior, it is not within their burden to have a counter narrative that they, as long as, you know, they're going to prioritize some forms of collective action and the majority of her negative argumentation was focused on the harms of individualism. But what does Mezen tell us after? Mezen tries to tell us, oh, since there is an overwhelming amount of individual minds in the status quo, they are okay with co-opting certain aspects of it. They are okay with having parts of it and getting both benefits at the end of the day. Which one is it? You can't have both, given that both of the norms are antithetical. Because when you remove the existence of a norm, given that's what people look up to, you have to have a replacement that people will look up to. They cannot look up to two norms at the exact same time. But third criticism on the unfair framing that they're trying to push us in terms of the state of the world. Opposition tries to tell you that somehow on their side, collectivism is a overall net good because the people you are relying on, the community you're relying on, is benevolent and has the ability to help you in the first place. But when they're pushing the harms on our side, they're trying to tell us that no, the individual the individual is incapable, the individual is irrational, and the individual will be harmed if he does not or if they do not, you know, go to other people for help. Understand that this is just debating on the most extreme of margins. Unlike my partners, who are the, including myself, who during the entire debate have been debating on different frames and contexts that are varying in scale, which means that we are more engaged and charitable both in the best and worst cases. Compare this with the unresponded arguments and that come from us, especially those, the extensions coming from my partner. The empowerment pushes that come from me and Kim to talk about why the empowerment that comes from a more and the rise of the more individualistic mindset and the more every man for himself narrative has necessitated social pushes and pushes for social upward mobility. Opposition tries to say that, oh, it's symmetrical either way, institutions have bad actors. They clearly aren't listening and are very disingenuous and this is an absurd response. Why? We have already proved to you the clear and direct linkage on why the prominence of the collective norm on their side of the house is what necessitates the power of these institutions. If there are bad actors and policies on both sides of the house, they gain their power and legitimacy from everybody consenting in the end goal of collective action and the collective good. In our side, at least we are able to counteract that narrative with the counter antithetical proposals of the norm against collectivism. The norm that individuals have the right to become individuals, they should not subscribe and they should not kill themselves for the good of the majority at the end of the day. TLDR, understand that we win clearly this debate because we are, if, if both sides prove, if both sides claim that the world is shit and the world is full of cutthroats, we win on our side because we either deal with that narrative by providing a counter narrative, which is the one we're defending. But number two, even if we can't deal with that narrative, we can better adapt to it because everybody expects the world to be shit from an early age. So they rely on themselves and improve their skills to make better the rest of their lives. Thank you. Thank you, God reply. Um, that must be the end of this debate. Uh, you guys can virtually cross the floor, virtually shake hands, and then please leave the Zoom room as soon as possible so that the judges can submit their ballot. We'll announce the results later. Thanks for the round. Bye-bye. Thank you.